Good morning. We're in Colossians chapter 2. Second chapter of Colossians. Title of the message this morning is Walking with Jesus. So I'd like to invite uh, all of us to consider walking with Jesus and what that would look like, what that entails. I've been, uh, I'm, Chad probably can testify to this, whenever we get ready for sermons, the more we study, the more convicted we get ourselves. Amen, Chad? <laughs> and by the way, welcome back, young people from uh, Russville. We're so, so pleased, so blessed to know you, and so proud of what you're doing, learning to walk with Jesus, serving and ministering in his name. That was a special picture you posted up, Chad, about ministering to that lady. There Was it a nursing home that she was in? Nursing home, Holly? Yeah. That was real touching. I had a dream the other night. I had a dream. How many of y'all know Tom Prock in our church? I had a dream about Tom Prock. I dreamed to, in this dream, Tom Prock and I, we were going somewhere doing something, and we were in an accident, and we died in this accident together. And the moment we died, you know, you kind of wake up in another reality or open your eyes in a new reality. And this new reality was a little bit different than what we had anticipated in my dream. Because in, in this dream, I dreamed that, first of all, the, before we got to the pearly gate, we had to go on a journey. And in this journey, we had to travel across this great long plain, vast plain, like the Great Plains. And then we had to cross this great mountain range, like the Rocky Mountains. And then when we got on the other side of the Rocky Mountains, we had to swim across this great ocean, like the Pacific Ocean, before we made it to the Pearly Gate. And so, we started off across that great plain, and sometimes I can be a little bit clumsy, if, in case you didn't know that, And I stepped in a gopher hole and broke my ankle. (coughs) So me being the great personality that I am, I said to Tom Proc, Tom, you go on and you just leave me here. Good luck, buddy. (coughs) And Tom being Tom Proc said, I ain't leaving you behind, Chuck. And he threw me over my shoulder like a bag of potatoes and he started off and he went across that great plain carried me over his shoulder and then we got to that great mountain range and he scaled those mountains climbing with me on over his shoulder up that great mountain range I mean you can imagine the kind of energy and exertion that he had to put out and then when we got the other side he came to that great ocean you couldn't see the other side he said I'm not leaving you back here I'm not leaving you behind and he jumped in with me on his back and he started swimming across that great ocean and we got to the other side of that ocean and there was the pearly gates Tom carried me up to those pearly gates and we stood there looking at the gates and all of a sudden that gate opened and there was St. Peter St. Peter looked at us and he looked at me and he said Chuck man it's really great seeing you. You come on in. Tie your mule up over there. You come on in. <laughs> I told that on Tom in the 830 service. I did switch it around in the 830. <clears throat> what does it look like to walk with Jesus? Okay. <laughs> How many of y'all would like to be known as someone that walked with Christ? Amen. Amen. How many of you would rather be known as someone that walked with the devil? (laughs) So, walk with Jesus. I want us to just explore for a few minutes. Stand up with me. We're in Colossians chapter 2. We're in Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to be reading verses 6 and 7. Then we'll pray and you can be seated. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. 
Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you in the name, through the blood of our Lord Jesus. We're so grateful for the salvation of our souls through the sacrifice of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus. We thank you. We owe you everything. And now then, as we continue in our journey here in this life as believers, Lord, speak to our hearts this morning about what it means, what it looks like to actually walk with Christ in our day-to-day -day lives, moment by moment. And I ask you this, Father, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So the Apostle Paul, right in the church of Colossae, says there in verse number 6, you need to walk with Christ. Walk with Christ. And so the question is this morning, or the invitation is this morning, let's walk with him. And what does that look like? What does it mean to walk with Christ? And am I, just each one of us, ask ourselves this question, am I daily, moment by moment, walking with Christ? Because as Paul makes this statement to us, it's not a suggestion. It's kind of like a command, an order. You need to walk in Christ. Walk with Christ. So what does that look like? Turn with me to Luke chapter 9. Gospel of Luke chapter 9 verses 23 through 27 I'll be reading because Jesus speaks directly to this many times, several times through the Gospels but this is kind of a good summation here. Luke chapter 9 verse number 23 this red letter, this Jesus Christ and he says this, verse 23, Luke 9 23 Then he said to them all if any man wants, or if anyone wants to come with me, he must. Notice that little word must. It's an imperative. He must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So this is explicitly what Paul is saying to the church at Colossae. We need to walk with Christ. Verse 24, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. What is a man benefited if he gains the whole world, yet loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, and that of the Father and the holy angels. I tell you the truth, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So back up in 23, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And again, as Jesus, well, he's kind of putting this as an option. I mean, it's a decision that we make. As a believer, we're going to make a decision to follow Christ. Now, let me put it this way. If God's only purpose in saving us was to take us to heaven, if that was God's purpose, only purpose then the minute you and I got saved, he would kill us and take us to heaven, amen? If that was his only purpose. That's certainly part of the purpose, but God has a reason for us being here as believers. God has a God-ordained purpose, reason for us to be here. So let's think about that for a minute. Individually, okay, and also as a church body, but especially individually, why... What would, what would my life look like if I were doing what Jesus says here, if I would deny myself, deny myself and take up a cross and follow him? You know the word self, that's a word that's used a lot today, you know, the self. Um, I hear, I call it psychobabble. 
I hear a lot of psycho babble about the self. A lot of teaching out there is we need to discover ourselves. <laughs> Have y'all ever heard talk like that? In order to be a fulfilled, complete, whole person, we need to discover ourselves. Well, let me tell you what. The Word of God discovered ourself, and the Word of God tells us that ourself is fallen. Okay, we have a fallen creature, human nature that is opposed to God. It's opposed to the ways of God. As a matter of fact, when you really think about it, biblically speaking, when we get saved, we get saved to God, but another thing, we get saved from ourselves. The person that lives their whole life trying to uh, discover themselves is a very self-centered person person and Jesus says we must crucify we must deny our self that's the exact opposite of the psycho babble of this world does that make sense my fallen nature uh, the Bible talks a lot about the fallen human nature it opposed to God, it cannot know the ways of God, can't know the will of God, cannot do the will of God in our own self. We need Christ. And the apostle tells us it needs to be like a couple weeks ago in the message, Christ in you is the hope of glory. How many of us as believers really consciously on a day-to-day -day basis live with the conscious awareness that the Spirit of Almighty God lives in us. Uh, what happens to somebody um, in our life that, in, in, let's say in a personal encounter, what happens to somebody when they encounter our self, <laughs> this selfish, self-centered, fallen nature that we have? Do you think that's a real uh, blessing <laughs> to encounter the self-centered nature of humanity? I don't. I, I, I hear it sometimes like this. Well, I'm just going to give them a piece of my own mind. Amen. Well, congratulations. You're going to give them a piece of your own mind. I'm just going to tell them exactly what I think. Yeah. Well, isn't that going to bless their heart? <laughs> To hear exactly what you think, exactly the way you feel. A lot of times our feelings, a lot of times the psycho babble of this world would make a god of our emotions. We need to follow our emotions. We need to feel free to expect our emotions. And you know what the Word of God says? The Word of God actually says the person that is led and controlled by their emotions has a fool in charge of their life. A fool. Do you know what, how serious it is when God called someone a fool? <clears throat> I think he called one a man a fool. Jesus called one man a fool. And that day that he called him a fool, that guy woke up that night in hell. A fool. When you have your emotions in control of your life, the Bible says you have a fool in control of your life. How many of people want to be a fool? Just follow the psycho babble of our day and you'll have a foolish life. It's not Christ. Christ in us is the hope of glory. Jesus says in Luke 9, if you, come, if you would come after me, if you would walk with me, you must, it's not an option, you underline must deny yourself and take up your cross. And follow me. So I've been asking myself the last couple of weeks when people encounter me, <laughs> do they encounter me or do they encounter Christ in me? And our goal should be the latter. Our goal should be that people encounter Christ in me. Amen? I mean, that's God's goal. Let's look at it this way. Let's go to the next point bodybuilding. The apostle says there in Colossians, we need to be built up in the faith. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 is a good starting place, one starting place. Philippians 1, 6. Right in church Philippi, the apostle Paul says this, I am sure of this, that he who started, notice that word start, it's a process that begins at salvation. He who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. 
That sounds like a good promise. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 20. I think we all know this verse. I mean, I hear it spouted off kind of glibly sometimes, the first part of it. But, you know, it, it does have a follow, it does have a complete statement that we need to be aware of. Romans 8, 28, we know, we know all things work together for good. I hear that a lot. Oh, all things work together for good. <laughs> yeah. What's the good that all things are working together for? That, that's the thing we need to know. What is the good? So let's read on. We know all things work together for the good of those who love God. Those who are called according to his purpose, okay? Well, what is his purpose? Like I said, if God's only purpose for us getting saved was to take us to heaven, he'd kill us when we got saved. But he's got another purpose. What is his purpose? That's in verse 29. For those he foreknew, he also predestined, or as King James, predestinated, that they would be what? That they would be conformed to the image of his son so that he'd be the firstborn among many brothers. So let me tell you what that says. What it plainly says is this. God has one purpose, one main purpose for every child of God's life and that is to create within us the character of Christ. He's got no other main purpose. Now, as we develop the character of Christ, he can do all kinds of great stuff through us. Amen? But his purpose, his predestined, predetermined, and when God makes a determination, he's just kind of pretty hard-headed. Amen? <laughs> his purpose is to create Christ in us, the character of Christ in us. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus puts it this way. 28, 29, 30. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me or learn to be like me for I am humble and gentle and you'll find rest in your souls. That's the way Christ put it. The character of Christ, humility and gentleness. I've got a book in my library by Mike Huckabee. Uh, he wrote somewhere around when he's run for president. He even, he even signed it. And the title of the book is Character is the Issue. And Mike got it exactly right. Character is is the issue and my friends for those of us that are sons and daughters of God character is the issue God has determined that he wants us to become like Christ how many of y'all how many of you ladies have ever had a baby all right moms and dads how many parents have ever had a baby <laughs> when that baby was born was it your intention, was it your purpose that they would spend the rest of their life weighing seven pounds, eight ounces and being diapered by you and hand fed by you or breastfed by you the rest of their entire life? How many of you, that was your goal for that child's life? Anybody? The sad thing was, what, what if we did, what if you had a child like that that would not grow, could not grow, did not, was not able to develop past that birth stage? That would not be normal. That would not be a healthy child. Amen? Let me tell you what. The moment we're born again, we are a newborn child of God, and God is intent on not leaving us at that newborn place. Okay? God wants us to grow, grow being built up, as he says to the church of Colossae there in chapter 2. Built up in the faith. That doesn't happen accidentally. What, do you, what would you think about a child that would refuse to eat? That had absolutely no appetite. Sometimes I think about that a lot with believers that got no desire for God's spiritual food. No desire for God's spiritual milk. These are images that Paul talks about to different churches. You know, you come wanting milk. You need to be desiring meat. We need to be growing in the Lord. Amen. And what is the purpose again? What's the goal? The goal is Christ. The goal is Christ in us. The character and the nature of Jesus Christ. What do you think people encountered when they encountered Christ? 
You know, in, the, in, in, the, in his earthly life, when he's in the flesh, when he was here, walked among us. Let me tell you something about Jesus that we see in the Gospels, all right? You know who is attracted to Christ? I mean, they came flocking to him in great numbers. You know who came to Christ? Needy people. You know who is offended by Christ? Self-righteous people. The ones that had it all figured out. The ones that knew everything. You know, the holy, the self-righteous. And you know what those people, what their response to Christ was? They hated him. They hated him. But who flocked to Christ? Why do you think needy people flock to Christ? Uh, let, let me just put it in one kind of one, one simple statement because he loved them. Okay? He loved them. He ministered to them. When they left him, they felt encouraged, they felt enlivened, invigorated. Maybe they were healed, maybe, you know, maybe they were fed. Whatever their need was, when they left him, they were refreshed. Let me, so I've been asking myself this question for a couple of weeks. Okay, when people meet Chuck, when people are around Chuck, Chuck, do they, do they leave refreshed? <laughs> Don't answer. And I've been thinking about it like this. The most basic, the most real place this should start is in my most intimate relationships, right? Not just, you know, the passerby on the street, but in my family. Don't you all ask my wife if every time she's around me if she leaves feeling refreshed, okay? <laughs> or encouraged, or built up, or edified. Those are good scriptural words, to be edified, amen? Amen. When people meet us in our life, do they feel edified by the presence of Christ or do they feel somehow smaller because of our self, our selfish, self-centered? I know someone taught it, put it this way years, uh, several decades ago. We need to be energy givers, not energy takers. When somebody is with us, do they leave energized because of Christ in us or do they feel depleted washed out that's the most real in our home in our closest relationships whatever those might be I remember when I was a kid there was a song home on the range y'all remember this song Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. I've, I've amended that song for the self-centered lives that goes like this. Home, home on the range where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard an encouraging word. And the skies are dark and dreary and cloudy all day. Do you know what the easiest thing to fall into is as a human being? Negativity. It's the easiest thing. It's contagious. Negativity is contagious. Criticism. Rumors. Fault finders. I promise you, the easiest thing in the world to do is to find fault in people. That's a snap. You know why it's so easy? Because it's the devil. The devil's good at his game. I mean, the Satan means accuser, the accuser of the brethren. We're, we're never more like the devil when we are filled with accusations. Accusations. That's the work of the devil. It's easy. It comes natural. It's part of the self. <laughs> it's part of the psycho babble of the world. I need to discover myself. You know what people need? 
people need us to discover them where are their hurts what are their needs in their life people need to be encouraged not defeated put down demeaned debased debauch we need to be built up okay so he says at the end of uh, verse 7, Colossians 2, rejoicing always. Look in 1 Thessalonians 5. This is a good little kind of way to work on it. We'll start at verse 15. This is Paul, the apostle, writing the church at Thessalonica. Some instructions inside the, for the church. First Thessalonians 5:15. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. 16. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. 18. Give thanks in everything for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus and it's kind of like verse number 19 says and if you don't do those if you don't rejoice if you don't pray if you don't give thanks in everything you know what you're going to do you will stifle the spirit of God rejoice always pray constantly give thanks in everything for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus don't stifle the spirit don't despise prophecies, test all things, hold what's good, stay away from every form of evil. And then 23, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. That's the work of God in us. God is working to sanctify us. And what is that? That sanctifying work is creating Christ in us, the nature and the character of Christ. So, let's bow for prayer. So our goal ought to be God's goal. Sounds kind of silly to say something like that, but our goal ought to be God's goal, amen? And God's goal is what? It's to create Christ in us. I've heard this before, and, and you've probably heard it before too, you know, folks that are outside of the church, not Christians, and maybe you've talked to them, invited them, and you've probably heard something like this. I ain't going to go down there. That place is full of a bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> Y'all ever heard anything like that? There's a bunch of hypocrites down there. And typically the preacher, the preacher response is, well, they're right where they need to be, amen? <laughs> if, they're, if, if they're in church, that's where they ought to be. That's not the right answer. According to the Word of God, the non church around us the world around us when they think of this house their first thought ought to be Christ is there I encounter Christ there I encounter Christ in the members of that church that's what the apostles say Could we say that's the reputation of Cedar Heights here in our community? When people think of Cedar Heights, Christ dwells there. I encounter Christ there. I encounter the Spirit. I'm fed there. I'm encouraged there. I'm lifted up there. I can live there. I can breathe there. See, that is God's goal. That's God's goal for us as a church. That's God's goal for me as an individual believer. So let's be thinking about this in our day-to-day -day life. I mean, this is walking with Christ. This is what Christ did, okay? He, whenever people met Christ, they left refreshed, One, whatever way it was. Now, the self-righteous, no, they left, you know, sometimes with some pretty harsh words. But the everyday folks, they left refreshed, encouraged, renewed, restored, whatever the need was. Don't you want to be that? Amen? 
I mean, doesn't that sound a whole lot better than somebody that goes around discovering their self? <laughs> self, self, self-centered, self-focused, self-actualized, whatever the cycle babble is. No, I want to be Christ discovering. I want to be Christ living. I want it to be Christ in me. That's the hope of glory. Chad's joining me here at front. Jennifer's going to lead us. So I'm going to pray and then we'll stand. And whatever the Lord is saying to you today, you respond to the Spirit of God. If you're here this morning without Christ, He is here to restore you, to renew you, to save you. You respond to Him, whatever the need is. Father, we come in Jesus' name this morning. We come before you through his blood. We come before you as born again sons and daughters of God. We come before you, Father, because you've invited us to come. You've told us to come to make requests. You've told us to come and you would feed us. You would nourish us. We come before you, Father, because we're hungry to know more of you. Father, we come before you this morning because we're tired of living self-centered lives. We've tried the wares of the world. We've tasted the best this world has to offer and we've learned it's rancid. We want living water. We want the bread of life. And we want to share that water. We want to share that life with those closest to us and those around us. God, let us be life givers, life sharers, not energy takers for your glory. In Jesus' name, you stand. Jennifer, you lead us.
Yes, I love you is all I need. Take everything. Father, you have not called us to just be who we are. You have called us to be like Christ. And I pray, Lord, because we can't do this apart from your grace. So I pray that you would flood your people with your grace so that we may live as you have called us to live. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.